Father God, we, uh, we thank you for your word. We pray that, that you would, you've blessed everything here today, that, that you have opened our ears and our hearts to receive, and that we will walk out of here changed by you and your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so the power of the presence is what we're going to talk about this week, and that is, but hopefully it sounds a little more like a conversation than, than trying to preach today. It might get a little preachy, but I want, I want to take a second to, a second to examine what, what does our prayer life look like and then completely kind of set that aside. We're not talking about prayer this week. We're talking about the presence of God like in our face. So we're going to talk about two types of the power of the presence. The first being the omnipresence of God. We'll define that in a minute. And the second being the manifest presence of God. So one of the inspirational verses for this week was, Acts 4.13, and it says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So we don't, this, please understand, anything I'm talking about today is not about people in position, the, the fivefold ministry, any of that stuff. This is about the ability to have the unique, Moses was nobody he, was, he had no position, no authority, no nothing when he went and he spoke to God. Jacob was nobody when he, went, when he wrestled with God all night long. This is for everybody and anybody. This is not about specific people. This is available to us all. And so for the healing power of God's people, I want to talk about 2 Chronicles 4 or 7.14. And it reads, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So this, this healing power that exists when we are seeking his face. And again, we're not, we're not talking about, about prayer. We're talking about the specific seeking of his face this week. So when we talk about omnipresence, the, the quick definition of that is that God is everywhere and he is always, right? There, there's no like, oh, well, he was over there this week and, you know, he's spending this week in Europe kind of deal. Like, he's here all the time. And no matter how far away we may get from him, he's always immediately behind us if we were to turn around. So we want to lose this concept that God is a faraway God. God is a God who's in heaven, right? It's a it's a triune God, and the Holy Spirit remains with us. So Jeremiah 23, 24 says, Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. So again, with this, this concept of making sure we understand God is with it. He gets to you. There's, you know, we allude to sometimes there's, there's other religions that believe that if you were to go behind a wall, then, then your God wouldn't be able to see what you're doing behind that wall. Our God is not like that. He goes with us. He can see us. He can read our hearts. He, we, he doesn't even need to see us in our actions. He already knows what's within us. The psalmist in Psalm 139, 7, 8 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I, if I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Again, no, no escaping his presence, not that we should really want to. So it's necessary to understand this truth, that God is always with us. He's always present. He's always available for this relationship. If we're going to change our thinking, right, from this idea of a physical distance from God to degrees of awareness and revelation. So as an example, maybe you've lived in a home with somebody for a while and you're physically present, but yet, relationally, you're, you, you might as well have a football field between you. And so, just because we know God is present and close to us doesn't mean we are emotionally and relationally close to him. We want to make sure we are available for that. So the manifest presence is this, this different occurrence, right? So there's the, the, the knowledge that God is in all places at all times, but this manifest presence, to, if we were to define it, would be a communicated awareness of God's presence and ex experiential presence. So um, a lot of times we'll see this, uh, multiple times we see this in the Bible, and it, it's actually referred to as a theophany, which is this, this representation, this manifestation of God. So we see this with the burning bush with Moses. We see when, when Jacob is uh, wrestling all night long and he gets his hip dislocated. 
Um, there's multiple occurrences when, when Abraham is approached and he's told that he's going to be made a father when he's you know, roughly 80-something years old. This is, this is God showing up in a physical, physical, visible form. When the Israelites are, are migrating for 40 years, they're following a column of smoke and a column of fire. So these are these actual manifestations of God. So we may see that in a divinely inspired awareness or powerful hope and joy, something that overwhelms and overcomes you within. That may occur during an event like maybe a really deep prayer. You know, you were like literally just, you were laying it all out for him and you were begging for his help. Maybe it was a really powerful worship session for you. I, it, it's different for everybody how it may show up. We see an example of a, a cloud shining in the New Testament account on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so in, in the Mount of Transfiguration, it's, it's kind of unique. We see that God, uh, Jesus, in, in this, this meeting on the, on the top of the mountain, there's this occurrence that occurs with his faith. Like he, he appears different. And Moses, after he speaks to God, the burning bush, and, he's, and he goes to him again and again, and he speaks with him, his, his face comes back and he's glowing. There's, there's something that's physically changed in him to the, the point where he veils his face from the other Israelites because his, his face is appearing so different because he's been in the immediate presence of God's manifest presence. You may hear an audible voice. You may, you may detect uh, what Pastor Tony first to was a still small voice. It may be clear as day, like you're having a conversation back and forth, and it may be something that speaks within you here and here versus in your ears. And then there's, there's revelation. You know, there's general revelation for everybody. There's, there's these specific revelations that occur to each one of us. So all these things, this is, this is God manifesting in our lives. There's just different examples. So Exodus 33, 11 is another one of the scriptures was, was the inspiration for this series. And it says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So that's what we're talking about. So there's a difference. So, so Moses is kind of like all about God's business, right? So he's meeting with God. He's speaking to him. He's getting, okay, this is the guidance you have for me. And they, yet they spoke as friends. Meanwhile, when he leaves, Joshua just wants to kind of camp out there and just like, hey, God's presence is here. I don't want to go anywhere else right now. I just want to sit here in this presence. And that's what we're going to kind of uh, talk about this week. So, so the question is, how should we, or even should we at all, seek to connect with God on this level? Because this is Old Testament covenant right here, where we see this opportunity to come to him face to face in this, this physical representation, right? But Hebrews chapter 8 says that this covenant that we live in, the new covenant, is a greater covenant says that there was actually something wrong with that previous covenant, which is why God came and made a second covenant, this new and greater covenant. So would it be wrong for us to even want to experience this, this, this Old Testament experience that we read about again and again? And I would say no. No, we should, we should definitely be seeking this. And we see that, one, because Jesus comes for that new covenant. He's, he is present with his disciples. And then he specifically tells us, I'm sending you my spirit, that he would be your comforter. We should have this experience at all times. We should be seeking for it. So let's look at a familiar scripture in a new way. And that is, uh, we'll, we'll get to this in just a second. Please, please keep in mind, be, be humble about your mindset, about what you've experienced to this point in your life relationally with God. The fact that none of us know what the limitations of our experience in his presence could be or should be. So keep, always keep that in mind. So Second Chronicles 7.14, again. So if my people are called by my name and humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So this is the recipe right here, a recipe for revival within the church. But prayer is the act of seeking, seeking of, inquiring from God. It's that supplication, that, that intercession, that, that petition before him, right? 
But seeking God's face is different. To seek his presence in his person. So to kind of liken those to two different things. So, so imagine prayer is seeking his arm or his hand, what can be provided, while the other is seeking his heart, seeking that relationship. Anybody watching The Chosen? No, yep, okay. All right, so we, uh, if you watch season two, it's not a spoiler. Don't worry, not a spoiler. Um, I think it's a beautiful depiction. I think it's a, it's a, for some people who are visual learners and you only get maybe so much from the word or so much from something else, it's another opportunity to experience what God might have for you to learn. And so there's this scene early in season two. I think it's early in season two. Jesus and his disciples, they're, they're in this, they're, they're guests at somebody else's home and they're, they're conversating with this guy. And the meeting is coming to an end. And there's this moment where Jesus, Jesus forgives him, right? But you, you see that coming a mile away. Like, okay, no surprise, Jesus has forgiven him. That didn't do much for me in the sense that it wasn't a surprise. But for whatever reason, as they're, as they're departing, Jesus gives him this embrace. He gives him a hug. And that broke me for a second. I felt in, so cheated. To know... To, to experience that, to know what it would be like to have his presence right there and to hug him, to have him hug you, to, for him to be your comforter in that moment of not only realizing you could be forgiven, but you could just be present with God. You could connect with him in a way that you had never done before. And uh, so usually when there's these like sensitive moments in a, in a movie or a TV show, my wife and I will kind of detect the other ones a little quiet and still, you know, because maybe, maybe there's something in our eye. And so we'll kind of look over at each other really carefully, and if we see it, we'll kind of make fun of the other one, but she didn't make fun of me, which meant she was probably doing the same thing. And it, just, it was just different. And I, I don't want to feel cheated. I want us to believe. I want us to understand that we can, we can experience what was displayed in that moment on that screen. This is not just for Old Testament people. This is not just for the disciples. This is... Of the, of the disciples of 2,000 years ago is for the disciples of today as well. I want you to have that, that thought, that belief that, that God wants to connect with you that intimately. And so Moses, he was actually presented with an opportunity uh, through their walk in the wilderness to, to just walk away from, from God and be like, hey, you know, we can go our separate ways. And he's like, God, I, d I don't want to lose your presence. I don't want to be without you because he had experienced it. But not everybody recognizes his voice, so it's important that we would learn to, to recognize his voice. And so, if you remember in, in, in the book of First Samuel, initially when God is speaking to Samuel, he thinks it's Eli, who is the guy he's, he's working for and living under his roof. So he, he wakes him from his sleep and he speaks to him, Samuel, so Samuel runs off to Eli and he's like, what, what can I do? What, what, do you, what do you need to do? Uh, I'm not talking to you. Get back in bed, kid, right? Again, Samuel, yes, Lord, he runs right back to him. And then Eli gets the picture. He's like, okay, listen up. This is God speaking to you. So next time when you hear your name called, just say, yes, Lord, and respond. This is God speaking to you. Be ready to speak back. And so he does. And so he, he is told and he is obedient in the Take a second and make yourself available to the Lord. Make yourself available to, to listen to his voice. And so the, the tragedy in this is, we see this with Samuel, who you know, becomes a great prophet for God and for his people. The realization that, that we may have missed his voice at times. That, that we have, maybe 10 years ago, maybe three years ago, maybe last week, maybe we thought we heard somebody say something to us, but... We looked around and we didn't see anybody say anything. In that moment, I would encourage you, make yourself available. See if that is God speaking to you. So this is how we become attentive to his word for us. Not his word for us, but his word for us. And so good relationship is going to require uh, clear communication. So it's important that we would seek him out for a clear understanding at all times. John 10, 27 tells us that my sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. So, seems pretty simple, but just in case that kind of 
glossed over something for you. It tells us three important things, that his sheep, his followers, those who claim his name, they hear him. He recognizes or acknowledges them, and they obey him. So the question is, do we fit individually? Do we fit that criteria? Do we hear him? Does he recognize us? And do we obey him? Which brings us to sitting or waiting before the Lord. And I told you we're going to, I want you to set prayer aside. Prayer might actually interfere with your ability to do this. So ignore, ignore the concept of trying to speak to God in this moment. So Psalm 27, 14 tells us, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Seems pretty simple. And Isaiah 40, 31 tells us, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. We're also told, seek and you will find. But yet, maybe we're not actually looking. Instead, we're concerning ourselves with all the things he tells us not to concern ourselves with. We're making the, the things of this world our priority. And yet the kingdom of heaven is at hand and is right here and it's right now. And we're missing it because we don't take time to be sitting and waiting on the Lord. You will if you hear me preach long enough, you will probably hear me say it like once a month. We, the, the curse of living in this country in this time is that we busy ourselves and we, we don't set aside enough time for the Lord. We, are, we have competing interests within our mind, competing interests within our 24-hour clock, and we need to be diligent and deliberate about setting aside time for the Lord. So, so again, sitting before the Lord, this is different than prayer. And what I mean by that is in prayer, we're, we're typically speaking. We're speaking. We're asking for, we're praying for other people. We're pouring ourselves out. Sitting before the Lord would be a silent, alone time, practicing to receive his presence. And you may go months or years, and that's where we, we risk getting impatient or getting, uh, getting deterred through, through our, our feeling like he's not responding to me or this is a waste of time. So we are, we are practicing approaching to receive not only what he wants to give, but his fellowship, his heart, not his hand. And I think this really keys in on it. So this humble attitude. So many times we, we approach anything, any, any communion time with anybody, Christian or not Christian, if we, if we are trying to be with somebody and in their presence, we have an expectation of what that's going to be like. Husbands and wives, before you met your husband and wives, you had this picture, you had this design. I feel like it's this current trend. I don't know if it was a trend 20, 30 years ago, but I hear... I see these things about young women. They've got this list of qualifiers for their husband, right? You got to meet this checklist. There's these expectations. And with that, it, kind of, it can contort and mess up our, our anticipation, the ability to just sit in awe and wait for what is this going to be like? See, it's our expectation that causes us to try and control the situation, to try and manipulate, not in a bad way, but just to try and, and rearrange things our way in our prayer life or, or when we're waiting on God to do something. But if we show up with anticipation versus expectation, then we allow him to reorganize everything we ever thought. In this moment of anticipation, you should be ready and willing to abandon every theological thought you've ever come to. I'm not telling you that all your theology is wrong. What I'm telling you is, time and time again, we see God, whether speaking in the Old Testament or Jesus while speaking in the New Testament, we see him shatter our earthly understanding of what it is to be with him, what it is to be about him. Be ready to have that shattered. If we are constantly married to our theological leaning, whatever that may be, that will be the filter in which you allow God through. 
But if we're looking for God, if we're waiting for his presence to show up, then we allow that to dictate our theology, not what 20 dozen authors have written over the course of a couple centuries to tell us about God. You can read all the books you want. All those go to the wayside. You might as well burn them in the yard the second you experience the presence of God. This allows for personal growth and experience. And it's always going to be personal. I mean, you may come away with, with a word of prophecy for somebody or, or a group of people. But more than likely, what, what you have occur between you and God is going to be intimate and secret. It's going to be so close hold. You'd be a fool to share it at some times unless it's just for testimony purposes. Psalm 145, 18 through 19 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. So the promise is that if we call on the name of Jesus, that he is near. We got to really trust that. Because we've spent the majority of our life not truly experiencing his presence in our lives. A back and forth relationship versus, you know, like it's a moment here and there where we might feel like, man, he just really spoke to me or he really just, he got me through this moment. Because Matthew 7, 23 says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, and then will I declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He is always available to us. But if we're simply calling on his name, we're going to show up. When he, when he shows up and we come, come running to him and say, Lord, Lord, if we weren't living in his ways, if we weren't following his word, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And I want that for any of us. So real quick, we're going to go over uh, about four, four examples of, of things we should be doing or avoiding when, when trying to do this sitting before the Lord thing. So the first one would be the challenge of distractions. And if you've ever gone into your prayer closet or your man cave or wherever it is you go for prayer, maybe it's in your car, I don't know, and you attempt to sit in pure silence and just be still before the Lord and maybe hear if he's got a word for you, you'll notice that your mind has never been so loud and so active. It is constantly running. And so the challenge is these, the distractions that pop up in our minds, not, it's not the things that we see outside if we're isolated, right? Is the mind will wonder, it will distract you. You might even find yourself you know, falling asleep and you're struggling just to stay awake. It'll be filled with you know, pressing needs like, oh man, I can't forget to do this. These things have to be done any kind of urgent matter, stuff like that. So it's going to take time. You're probably not going to achieve or receive the kind of presence you're hoping for if you go into the closet for five minutes and you're like, all right, God, you got five minutes with me today. You, you're probably never going to have the time to calm your mind and, and cast all those things out before you could even have a chance to hear him. And so the next is patience. And so, again, I just referenced five minutes. So do your best not to put a timetable on God, right? Be willing to, to give him an hour. Be willing to give him two hours, whatever it may be. But it's kind of hard to do that if we make this the last thing we do in the day. It's kind of hard to do that if we don't deliberately set aside this time with him. And so one of the things that you'll do if you're impatient is it gets kind of awkward. You just, okay, well, I'm just sitting here. Lord, please show up. I want to feel your presence. Please, please overwhelm me with your spirit. Well, it's quiet, so I guess I'll start praying. Don't use this time for prayer. I find myself doing this. I'm like, well, all right, well, I'll, I'll pray because these things are on my heart and I've got this time with the Lord. Make this time different. Close down your mouth, close down your heart, do your best to close down your, your mind, and just listen. Just wait. And again, in our culture, it's so hard for us to do. But think about it like this when you're like, God, oh, I do this all the time. I've been doing it for four years, 
and I've heard nothing. It's unrewarding. It's wasting my time. What if God was just made, making you wait as long as you, you, he had to wait on you? How long would that be? So next is the power of priority. And so making God the priority, not a priority, but the priority. And that's not a chronological thing. So the first thing I do in the day it needs to be my God time. And it's not a numerically like, okay, I just, I place God above everything. It's just the priority that I don't want to do anything without setting aside my time for him. I don't want to do it. Like all these things I'm going to do for the next 10 years of my life would be so much better if I could say and experience, say that I have experienced and testify to that and be able to walk in that experience. I don't, not that I need to tell anyone about it, but doesn't it make your, your ability to evangelize so much all that more greater when you've had a Moses experience, when you've had a Jacob experience versus, well, I went to church on Sunday and we worshiped and it was powerful and it was awesome and the sermon was, it was all right. Completely different from I encountered God. I was face to face with him and it changed my life. I can only imagine how that would impact every relationship following. I can only imagine how that would impact the way we live out the Great Commission, the way we work in our ministries when we decide to make him the priority. So last is the, the cost of tuition. So you hear this, this Bible verse and it says, many are called, but few are chosen. The call goes out to all, right? But not all of us are willing to pay the price. And of those of us that are willing to pay the price, we may not have ever, th- if we don't consider the possibility of the things we never imagined, the things we never envisioned for our relationship in Christ, and we're limiting ourselves. I'm, I got a horrible imagination. I don't even have dreams most of the time. I don't know about you guys. I'm not a creative person. I don't want to be limited. I don't want to be limiting God's ability to move and manifest in my life because I was unwilling to see and look. I don't want my, my limited ability to understand and dream about what he would do in my life to impact and limit his ability to actually show up. Because some of, some of what's going to cause him to show up has to do with my faith and my desire, my seeking his face in the first place. If you believe that God will never show up in your life unless he's just got a super cool mission for you and you don't have a choice, why would he bother? If you don't have the faith and desire to seek his face, It'll just show up at your neighbor's door, maybe. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to put that on you, but I do want to put on you the fact that we are called to seek his face. He tells us, if my people seek my face. That's what he tells us to do. I want you guys to be empowered and encouraged when you leave here today to believe for the rest of your life that if you set aside time for God, If you come to him without a prayer in the world and you just say, God, I want to experience that hug. If you say, I want to experience your presence. He says he's going to show up. He says he's going to heal our land. Now you can make that about the the land within here. You can make it about the land you live on. I don't care. He tells us if we seek his face, he will show up. But the biggest price of all that we could pay is to be lukewarm, to be half-hearted about our pursuit. This is not easy. This is, we don't typically talk about this because it sounds kooky or weird half the time. But we've been leading up to this point for the last six weeks, guys. This is, this is paramount. This is our opportunity to realize we could experience what we've only read about. We could experience what generations haven't even believed about. And if you think that I'm talking like, oh, I was overwhelmed with the Spirit and I spoke in tongues, I'm talking past that. You could open your eyes and see a visible manifestation of God. You could reach out your hand and touch a physical manifestation of God. That's real. 
but we forget it. We live like that's not possible. We live like that's for the people of another age. And maybe that's why the church doesn't walk and live in the power that it's supposed to have right now. Maybe that's why we don't see the things we see in the book of Acts as we go out into the streets and we, and we worship within our, our churches. Maybe that's why we don't see the same power because we didn't believe. We've been limited by generation to generation to generation who didn't think that they, that they could experience it. And so we never believe, it's never been passed down to us. That's the biggest lie of all. So Wednesday night, Pastor Tony is going to talk about uh, tips, how to go about this, not for the purpose of replicating the way he does it or anybody else does it, but just things to consider. We, I think actually we're gonna do it as a panel. So not just making this an emotional experience, like, oh, God was with me, it was, it was overwhelming, but that we would be able to receive all that could be received in that moment or those moments. Because the, one of the dangers of this is trying to adopt somebody's form or format for how they were to do it versus just seeking his face, being open to his presence. Being, and I think that's our biggest challenge in this culture is that we could believe for a second that God would show up, physically show up with us. I want us to believe that today. And Wednesday night, if you, were to, if you were to watch, hopefully you would get something from that too. So you can watch this online or you can, you can show up in person. Either one's fine. God has something for each one of us. As long as we're willing to believe it and seek him for it, it's not gonna be financial, it's not gonna be job related, it's not gonna be family related. It's gonna be personal between you and him. I don't wanna feel cheated. I don't want you to feel cheated. We should not, if we claim the name of Jesus Christ, we should not be waiting until we get to heaven to experience what it is for that full embrace with Jesus. I want you to be encouraged in that. I want us to have the faith to believe it. So if you join me, we'll, we'll, we'll pray and I think we'll worship. Are we gonna worship one more? That's what I'm talking about. Father God, we thank you for your promise. We thank you for, for calling us to sit and seek your face, Lord, that we, would, that we would sit and diligently listen. I pray that you, would, that you would respond to us, Lord, that you would give us the encouragement that we need to stay in day in, day out as we wait to hear your voice, that you would put a desire in us, a belief in us that we haven't had before, a realization that you, you will show up. I want this for myself as much as any other brother and sister in here, but we want to walk out of here believing it, Lord. We want, to, we want to walk in this all week, all month, all year for the next decade, Lord. We want to know that you, you are waiting for us to open the door. I pray that you would walk into our lives, Lord, because we gave it to you, because we gave you the time, we gave you the energy, we gave, we gave our life over to you, Lord. I pray that you would put that in us. Pray that you would bless every brother and sister in here with that desire and that knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.